verses in, Ro in the book of Romans, or the epistle to the Romans, or letters to the Romans, whatever you want to call it. And we're breaking this down. We've looked at an overview of the whole book uh, in the sense of just kind of looking at some repeated themes in there and some uh, ideas that Paul keeps coming up with that stand out to you as you read through it. And we looked at some of those, and then we came back, looked at chapter 1, which deals with uh, people who have willingly turned and re turned from God or rejected God when they had the opportunity and they know Him in their heart and the, uh, they have a the opportunity to receive Him, but they rejected Him. Okay, the willingly, they just they don't want to receive that faith that God's given them. And so, therefore, we called last week the uh, uh, Romans one fool. Basically, we talked about the person who's just been totally, you know, given over to this and has just been rejected, given over to a reprobate mind because they're totally, uh, you know, just just uh, you know, fools. Basically, they just become foolish. Their foolish hearts darkened. So, in, anyone reading that, any normal person, saved or unsaved. But a normal person who just has a decent moral compass and knows right and wrong would look at that list and say, yeah, absolutely. Anyone just given over to all those things, any wicked, vile person who would do all that, I mean, that's a bad person. So when we knock on doors and ask about, you know, who, uh, if they know for sure they're going to heaven, what do they think they have to do to go to heaven? You know, a lot of people say, well, you just got to be a good person. Now, we know, what do you mean? There's no, none, none are good, right? We're all wicked. But... They're thinking, well, yeah, but wicked like I'm wicked is okay. Wicked like Romans 1, wicked, that's bad. You see what I'm saying? Like we understand that there are, there's a category of people out there that is just, just wicked, just monsters. And I've actually heard of people who had trouble with accepting Christianity because of the fact they said that, you know, well, the Bible just says, you know, everything's just forgiven and anybody, no matter how wicked they are, they can just be forgiven and all this kind of stuff. And they don't understand that. They're like, there's such wicked people out there. There are people that have done all these different things. And, and I just have a hard time thinking that just everybody can just go to heaven. Well, number one, what they're misunderstanding is, number one, yes, anyone can go to heaven and any sin can be forgiven. But what they're also missing is that there are people out there who are rejected of God because they've, they've totally given themselves to their flesh and followed their own heart and their heart was darkened and they willingly shut off and, 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 re, and rejected the Lord. So sometimes you'll see these psychopaths and I'm not even saying everyone who just does these wicked things or even murderers or whatever are reprobate and can't be saved. But I'm saying sometimes you'll see these vile people and they'll use examples of some of the most wicked people you've seen, you know, in our history. And they'll say, you mean to tell me that person is just going to go to heaven because, well, theoretically, if it was just a matter of them, you know, coming to the Lord and, you know, recognizing that they're a sinner and putting their trust in him for their salvation and all, you know, then technically they would uh, be able to be saved. But the thing is, those wicked people, you know, and I know they're not going to do that. OK, because they've already shut their heart off and, and their their minds been blind. They got a veil over their heart. I mean, over their eyes. And God has said many times in the scripture that they are. They're sons of Belial, like they're sons of the devil. They're, there's no, there's no turning them around. Okay, now obviously we can come back and maybe at a later date, it won't be part of this series, but I'll preach a message more specifically on that. It's hard to, it's really hard to put into words, and I'm still kind of scratching my head over some things and, and how I want to present that. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we could, the questions that could be asked about that category of people. But I think really in keeping with everything that Paul is saying in this book, that's really a secondary issue. That's really not even what he's talking about, okay? Because here's the thing. At the end of that chapter, everybody's like, oh, yeah, those are wicked people. At least I'm not that wicked. And then he starts with chapter 2 where he says this, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despise thou the riches of his suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up thyself uh, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, 
and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now let's just stop there for a minute. We understand, I believe everybody in here understands, there's going to be a day where God judges the earth. Okay, Everybody understands that. In fact, if you follow this thinking all throughout the Bible, there's one thing that's for sure. God is the righteous judge. God has to judge sin. He'll judge sin because he's totally righteous and holy. And we love to talk about the goodness of God and his mercy and his grace, which praise the Lord. I am thankful for that. But what we have to realize is that God has to judge sin sin. And so if we're flipping about that and we don't even think about, you know, sin, no big deal. You know, and again, we're talking about the gospel. You started in chapter one at the beginning of chapter one. He's wanting to talk about the gospel, about Jesus Christ coming and, uh, and dying. And he's our only hope by putting our trust in Jesus Christ. It's not our, our works that'll save us. But what he's doing is he's taking people to this point where they're realizing, look, we're all sinners. We're all sinners, and we must admit that. We must understand that we are uh, without excuse. And even if we judge the Romans one fool and say, man, those people are wicked. But look, there are some things in that list that we all do. You know, maybe not to the same extreme, not to the same level, and certainly not everything on that list. But there are some things in that list that we do. And so, you know, for a person to think that, you know, they're going to get away with doing whatever sins that they've done and God's never going to judge them, they would be really, uh, you know, fooling themselves because the day is everybody, no matter how good you think you are, will be judged. Now, I, I want to make a preface real quick. I, I'm not going to get to this to the conclusion, but I don't want you to spend the whole uh, sermon wondering if I'm leaving this important part out. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you now, for saved people that have put their faith in Jesus Christ, it's a different kind of judgment. Okay, but you're going to have to disregard that until I get to that point of the conclusion <laughs> or, or else uh, it won't make a whole lot of sense. But I want you to know that it's coming. Okay, so that you're not like, where is he trying to say? I don't think that you would get that from what I'm saying, but I want to make sure that you don't. Okay, because there is a difference between a person who's put their faith in Jesus Christ and, uh, and somebody who hasn't. But I'll get to that in a minute. So let's look at a couple of verses here. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, starting in verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works uh, that are therein shall be burned up. Now, what he just described there is everything we're going to read in Revelation, <laughs> everything you're going to read in Revelation, just summarized right here. He says, hey, the Lord is going to come back. You know, the clouds are going to be rolled back as a scroll. He doesn't say that, but that's what he says in Revelation. And the Lord is going to come back, and then he's going to pour his judgment out and his wrath on this world. And so anyone who's saying like, oh, yeah, well, where is he? Everything's continuing like it always has. And, and the wicked people are saying, you keep saying he's coming back to judge the world. But, but look, we're getting away with our sins and, and all this. No, they are being foolish because the reality is he is coming back. He is going to judge the world. And so he says all these things he's, he's going to do. He's going to come, but he's just waiting. He's giving everyone the last chance to hear the gospel, last chance to be saved and to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, it says. And look at verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall, uh, all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? I like how so often in the Bible, uh, just turn it on to the Christian and say like, you know, yeah, the world's wicked. Yeah, they're going to be judged. But you know what? How should you be living your life right now? What should you be living like? Knowing that God's a judge and God's angry with sin, why would you continue in sin? I'm going to go to heaven even if I sin. You Knowing that you're going to stand before God, you know what I mean? Knowing that he's the righteous judge. Why would you uh, want to continue in sin? And so this is what we see over and over. Jude chapter, well, Jude chapter 1, <laughs> the only, only chapter. Verse 14 and 15 says this, And Enoch, all right, here's a guy, the eighth person that was ever created, well, that man anyway, on the earth. Enoch, 
not eighth person, what is he? Seventh from Adam. I guess that would be the eighth person. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, uh, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walkers after their own lust. So Enoch was flinging her down in the early days, and he was saying, God's going to come back, and he's going to judge, and he's going to judge harshly about all these ungodly people doing ungodly things. We know since the beginning of the world, the fall of man anyway, that God's coming back, and he's going to judge the, the world. Now, a certain amount of judgment of God, punishment of God, based on our bad deeds, happens on this earth. Would you agree? Like, like basically, some of the things that we do that are against the Bible, against God, we naturally pay for it whenever we do it. I mean, that's just the way it is. Most of God's laws, I mean, they're not grievous, the Bible says, and they're for our own good. And if we would just listen to it and take heed, it would save us from a lot of trouble. So some of the punishment that we get on this earth, it will happen on this earth just from our, our foolishness. And I was thinking about this, uh, you don't have to go there, but so, uh, Proverbs chapter 7 is talking about uh, the strange woman and that she would try to like lure a man in and telling the man to flee from that. And he says, he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, right? You think about an ox, they don't even know they're being led right to the place where they're going to die, right? He says, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, right? A fool doesn't even realize that what he's doing is he's walking right into punishment. He's right, right into judgment. And he doesn't care. He just keeps on doing it. And then it's just like, oh, why am I being judged for this? Why am I getting in trouble? It's a punishment because you yourself were foolish. And so you're bearing your own punishment. This is the reality of life. But we do know for sure that despite any judgment that happens on this earth, just natural judgment, that in heaven, all things are going to be reckoned. And even if you didn't get judged for it on this earth, the sins that you committed, they're going to be judged because every sin has to be judged. And so if uh, uh, so, after we die, of course, there's going to be a lot of judgment. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Because we know there, there's death, and then after death, there's some kind of judgment. We understand that from, the, from God's Word. But in this chapter, Romans chapter 2, the emphasis seems to be not on the fact of just sin in general. We realize wickedness is, I mean, we realize people all the time, and they murder somebody, they're going to get punished. They steal and they're doing all these things, they're going to get punished. We, we understand that. We have a sense in our society about correcting, you know, and uh, injustices and stuff like that. So we understand punishment. We understand that. But the focus here seems to be secret sins, sins that people think that they're getting away with. They think that God's not seeing it, but the reality is there's nothing that is going to escape God. He's not going to be surprised uh, by anything that we do, okay? So those who would judge other people and say, yeah, that person, they've done these sins, uh, they're worthy to go to hell, and, and they've done all these things, and, 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 you know, good riddance, and our society doesn't need them, or whatever. Meanwhile, we're maybe hiding, sitting on some sins that we have in our own life that we would never want anybody to know about or some things that we've done that we thought that we got away with that we wouldn't want anybody to know about. And the reality is what he's saying here in, in chapter two is like, look, you know, don't you think that you're going to be judged for your sins as well? Now, again, I want to refer you back to my my disclaimer, wait till the end of the message, okay? If you're saved, it's going to be a little different, uh, but that doesn't matter. Let's, let's take that out of the equation right, right now because he hasn't got to that point yet in, in Romans chapter 3 where he says, all of sin and come short of the glory of God, and he begins to preach. He's just saying, look, we all are without excuse. God has put within us to know right and wrong. God has put within us to know there's a creator and someone who's going to be the judge, someone who's going to hold us accountable, and yet we are all sinners, even if you look at the, the most wicked among us and say, oh, yeah, they deserve hell. Well, the reality is you're a sinner, too. And who, why do you think you can judge other people and that you're not going to be judged yourself? And I believe that's what he's saying here 
in chapter 2. He's going to render to every man according to his deeds, it said in verse 6. And uh, in, I, before I get to the first point, I want to make this, uh, you say, first point? Yeah, this was all introduction. <laughs> I want to read this to you. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know, here's what I found out. When we all realize that we are sinners, and not only that we're sinners, but here's what I think about quite often. Giving a different set of circumstances, had I been raised in a different household, had I had different things, certain things happen to me that have happened to some other people, I wonder how, how much harder it would have been in my life to, you know, that struggle with sin, particular sins, and how, how much of a struggle I would have had with that. But the fact that at a young age I got saved and then I was raised in church after that and my family was going to church and, and my dad later on was a preacher and like I grew up hearing the, uh, hearing the word of God. And, you know, there was a lot of, hey, can I go do this? No, you can't do that because, you know, that's just asking for trouble or whatever. Thank the Lord I had parents stop me from that. Some people don't. Some people don't have that. And so they're going to end up probably, most likely, going down a path and falling into more sins, having a little bit more uh, uh, temptation and such. such. It would be really easy for me to be like, how wicked these people are. How could they fall for that? Here's something that I, I, we deal with every once in a while, and because uh, this is just our society is just over, just like it's just a, just skyrocketing on drugs and overdose. Of course, we had a, a situation here recently that made us all think about this, and so I started doing some studying on that. And if you look at the charts on, on overdose, particularly with one drug, fentanyl, and if you look at like over the last few years, at uh, the bottom of the chart, there's this line right here. And then about 2019, overdose on fentanyl is just like, whoosh. and from what I understand, between 2020 and two, or 2000, yeah, 20 and now, it's even gone like twice as high as that. So we're talking about off the charts, just people just turning to drugs because they can't deal with life or whatever. I don't know. And so they're, uh, they're just in And here's the thing. I could look at that and say, oh, these are the druggies and the scum of the earth and all this kind of stuff. But here's the reality. I don't know what that's like. I've never even smoked a cigarette. I've never even drank alcohol or had any kind of a desire to do those kinds of things. I wasn't around it, you know, for the most of my life. And whenever I was, it was with this context of, man, that's bad. You look what that's doing. That's destroying people's lives. And who would want to do that? And, and so, uh, so I don't understand that. So here's the thing. When we realize, though, that, you know what, but I do have a propensity to sin. I do have certain things in my life that I've been tempted to, and I've fallen into this sin and that kind of sin. And, and most of those, by the way, you Christians, uh, you, especially teenagers growing up in church, and, and it, you learn how to hide sins from your parents and all that kind of stuff. Hey, my, most of my sins that I dealt with were secret. They were private. Everyone thought, hey, good boy, he would never do anything wrong. Yeah, I did in private. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's, we all have a nature to do that. And so you learn how to just kind of go with the flow, act the part, look like a Christian. But you know what? We're all wicked sinners. And once we realize that, that does change our perspective on how we judge other people. Now, don't get me wrong. We've got to judge other people. That's just the reality of life. There has to be judgment. You say, well, the Bible says not to judge. Yeah, but you got to read that whole context. The Bible does say that we're supposed to judge. Uh, I mean, there, we have to have judgments, okay? But the reality is you don't want to judge somebody and be harsh on them and then forget the fact that you're a sinner too. And so what that does is allow you to re recognize, hey, I've got to maybe lighten up a little bit on how I deal with this. And I've got to take heed uh, lest I, lest I fall, you know, I got, I can't just sit here all pride, pridefully thinking like, well, I'm just so much better than these people. Look, once you've fallen into sin and people know that you're a sinner, which we all should recognize that and know about ourselves, but once it's known and everybody has seen your sinful act, all of a sudden it's really hard for you to condemn other people who are, who are sinners because you're like, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Right. And so that's the, that's the reality. And, and that's good. The fact that we all know that we're sinners. And we haven't even got to that in Romans 3 yet, but we know that that's true. Okay, now you're scared because I haven't even started the sermon yet, but it, it'll go quickly. <laughs> okay, so here's the first point. God will, we know that God's going to judge, but God will judge those secret sins, those sins that people think nobody else knows, 
uh, in studying that that sect of Catholicism, I mean, really uh, studying Catholicism in general, what you'll come to the conclusion if you study this, and let me just be frank, it's not just Catholicism, but it's independent Baptist and it's, and it's all over. But I was studying uh, this particular group of people that we're going to go preach to. And, uh, you know, sure enough, here is a bunch of people uh, following a guy whose name is Pius, <laughs> okay? And uh, spelled a little differently, but, and these guys are, they pride themselves and, hey, we've come out from the world and we're living holy. And if, and they've got this list of things, like, if you don't believe this, let them be, if this, someone doesn't believe this, let them be anathema. And, and basically, you know, they're believing in following the sacraments and doing all these works and, and all this. And so they think that they're getting to heaven based on their works, right? And so they're doing pretty good about showing the world that they're good people. But guess what you find out when you start studying? Sexual abuse that's been swept under the rug here, this lawsuit over here, this person that got paid to be quiet because they knew something that they didn't want to get out, and so they paid them to be quiet and all this kind of stuff. Why? Secret sins. People don't want you know, everybody to know about it, but they're still guilty of sins. And the Bible says that God is going to judge those sins. We're already at verse 5 and verse 6. Look at verse 16. It says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Now, again, don't be confused and think that Paul had another gospel. He says there is no other. There's just one gospel. Okay, If someone's preaching another gospel, it's not the real gospel. So when Paul says my gospel, he's talking about the gospel. All right, but he's just the one saying it. So he's saying, you know, this is my words and, and, and my gospel. But really, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's what he says, that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Now go to uh, chapter, uh, let me see here. Go to chapter, is that right, 14? And look at verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, I'll talk about that judgment seat of Christ later on. But you get this idea that all of us have sins and we're all going to be accountable uh, for our sins. And so God says that he will judge the secrets. Okay, a lot of us have this mentality. Because I think that anyone who truly believes in God and believes in Jesus uh, has the Holy Spirit within them, especially knows that God's watching everything that we do. And don't we sin anyway? You don't have to answer that, but I already know the answer. Don't we sin anyway? First John says, if anyone man says he is, doesn't have sin, he's made God a liar, right? <laughs> God said we're all sinners. Okay, but, uh, but even though we believe God is watching and we know that, that he sees our sins and we're sinning against him, do you know we have this mentality that's like, yeah, I just ask, I'll just ask forgiveness later. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure, he sees me. Sure, he's going to be mad, but I'll just ask forgiveness later. No, I mean, you can ask forgiveness later, and maybe he'll for, forgive you to an extent, but I, could, I won't take the time to do it, but I can show you in the Bible a lot of times where God forgave somebody, but they still got punished because he has to punish sin. Okay? And so... Uh, so anyway, we don't want to have that I'll apologize later mindset. Uh, we need to recognize that God is going to judge us. And so we need to not try to hide anything from him and just realize, hey, uh, and again, I know none of us can do that because none of us can be perfect, but we need to try. We need to try to, to, to walk uh, in righteousness so that we can be judged according to our righteousness. All right. Let me give you a couple other verses. I'll just read them to you. Psalm 98 says, thou hast set our iniquities before thee our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. All right, they're right before God's face. Those things that we think are secret, they're really like right in God's face. And he has the ability to make it known to all people. In fact, uh, Luke 8, 17 says, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And 
And so, chapter 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the, way, in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. That sounds good, doesn't it? Hey, just do what you want. Do what makes you happy. Walk in, the, uh, in, the, in your own ways, in the sight of your own eyes. But know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Isn't that so, a sobering thought? Look at chapter 12. Solomon concludes this chapter, and he says this in uh, verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So that's two parts of God's judgment. Here's the good news. God is going to judge every wicked thing, but there's another thing God can't do is He can't let good works go unnoticed. So part of His judgment is if you did something for the Lord, He's going to reward you for it. If you did something, you laid up treasures in heaven, you gave something up for the Lord, whatever the case was, and you did it for Him, He's going to, you have to rest assured one day, you're going to be judged on that, and you're going to be judged righteously, and you're going to be rewarded. And God's rewards are good. God's are like a hundredfold, you know what I mean? What you did for Him, He's going to reward you like a hundredfold, the Bible says. Okay, so God will judge the secret things. <clears throat> and, uh, and we know this. Look at, back to Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 11. Ignorance is not an excuse. Have you ever heard of that when it comes to like taxes, for instance? You're like, all right, I, I didn't know the tax law, so I shouldn't have to pay this fine. Nope, you still have to pay it, <laughs> right? If you break the law and they take you to jail, you can tell your lawyer, like, well, I didn't know that was against the law. It doesn't matter. It still is against the law, right? Now, maybe they'll be softer on you. I don't know. Maybe they'll, uh, you know, it's first time offense or whatever. But the reality is you have to be judged because you broke the law. Now, that's just in our messed up, crooked society that's, that, <laughs> that doesn't get all the uh, law enforcement, right? God's a perfect judge. Okay. And so you can't go to him and say, Oh God, I didn't know. That's not fair. God's going to be like, Hey, I judge wickedness and I judge righteousness. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you know, or where you were born or how old you are, or how long ago you did it. I'm going to remember, and I'm going to judge. Look at verse 11. Uh, chapter 2, verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. You say, well, I didn't know. I, didn't, I never knew the law. It doesn't matter. You st <laughs> still died a sinner. You know, even though you didn't have the law, you still died without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Okay, now I'm going to read this parentheses, and then I'm going to go back and read it without the parentheses. For not the hearers of the law are just before God. It doesn't matter if you heard it or not. But the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these have not the law, I mean, sorry, yeah, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile excusing or else, ex, I mean, accusing or else excusing one another, all right? Now, because that's all in parentheses, and Paul likes to write and run on sentences and parentheses and all that, let's go back to verse 12 again. And then I'm going to skip that. We're going to go straight to verse 16. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, verse 16, in the day, this is when there will be judged, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the day will come when all will be discovered, all will be judged, all will be uh, punished or rewarded, either way. Okay, so who will be judged? How sinful of a sin does it have to be to be judged? Hey, all sins are going to be judged. Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus said, every idle word shall be given an account. You'll be given account for every idle word. All sins will be judged no matter how long ago it was. God's not going to forget that. But Hebrews chapter 6 Verse 10 through 11 says that he's also not going to forget to reward you for the good things that you've done. So, so that's, the, that's the good news. He's not going to forget those good things that you did. Now, here's what Jesus did say. Now, if you did a good work, but then you, you did it to be seen of men, well, then you got your reward on this earth when people went, good job. That was your reward. 
You get to heaven, you say, hey, God, what about that time I did this and that? No, you already got a reward for that. See what I'm saying? So we want to make sure that our works that aren't, we're not doing it with the intention to be seen of men. I'm not saying if everybody, if don't ever let anybody see your good works. No, the Bible actually says, let men see your good works so they might glorify your Father in heaven. But I'm saying if your intention is, I'm only doing it to be seen of men, well, you're not going to get rewards for that in heaven. But God knows your heart, and, uh, and He'll take care of all that uh, in the end. So the, the second point, real quickly, uh, is that we all have secret sins. We all have secret sins, and, and I've already actually talked a lot about that. And so uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip over to the last point. Now, the last point doesn't have anything to do with our text necessarily, but it's a po point that I feel like is necessary to make. And this is what I gave the disclaimer about in the very beginning. Okay, maybe you're sitting here as a Christian thinking about this. And I remember as a little kid, even after I was saved and, and just hearing all this preaching, and I remember thinking, like, man, God is going to hold me accountable for every little thing I do, every idle word that I've ever spoken, every secret sin that I've ever done. And he's going he's gonna to, like, make manifest that, and it's going to be seen before all men. And I had this picture. I think I even heard messages about this growing up where they said, one day you're going to get to heaven, and there's going to be a t big TV screen, and everybody that's standing in line is going to watch as God just runs through all the secret sins that you've done in your life. And as a little kid, I'm sweating. I'm like, oh, no, I don't want people to see secret sins that I've done. Take a breath because that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not going to happen. And, uh, and you say, well, how do you know that's not going to happen? Because Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. And when we received the Lord as our Savior, you know, those sins were put on Him. Now, that's only true if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and been saved. If not, hey, yeah, you're still going to be judged one day. So I want to take you to two passages of Scripture that will help prove that point, and it will help you maybe if someone's kind of confused on that, or maybe you are. I believe these passages will help you understand that, and, uh, and I think it's good for you to know that there are two different judgments. Okay, we already read one. Uh, where was that? In, in Romans 14, where he said uh, that we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. Okay. Now there's two judgments. There's two judgments. There's the judgment seat of uh, I'm sorry, the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah, that's what it's called, right? And this is when the Lord comes back. And I'm, I'm going to show you this from Revelation in a minute. When the Lord comes back and He takes believers out of here, okay, whatever point that is, however you know, I'll, I'll preach that another day. When He takes us out, He gives us, He rewards us according to our works right then and there, okay. And therefore, if he's basing it on a reward system, if he's going to give us, you know, what we've done for him, then he also will not reward us for those things that we don't deserve because we did it to be seen of men or whatever. Does that make sense? So he's still giving you a reward and he's still judging you and he's judging you according to your sins, so to speak, because you know what, whatever you didn't do for Christ, you're not going to get rewarded for that. And I'll go to that passage of scripture in a minute. Most of you guys already know it, but look over at Romans chapter, I mean, Revelation chapter 20. All right, this is practically the end of the Bible. You got just a couple chapters after that, but, uh, but this is where it all kind of climaxes to this end of the world idea. <clears throat> I don't even have any notes from this point on, so this is all off the cuff. Okay, Re Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon. Well, who's the dragon? That old serpent. Who's the serpent? Which is the devil? The devil as in Satan. <laughs> And bound him a thousand years. What happens during that thousand years? Well, that's what we call the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, And we'll rule and reign, Christians will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So let's keep reading. And cast him, that's Satan, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones... 
and they uh, sat upon them, and, ju and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and uh, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, you kind of have to know other passages of Scripture and read between the lines here. It's not just those people that were beheaded and they, and they follow Christ during, the, during the, uh, that tribulation period that are going to rule and reign with Him for a thousand years. It's all believers. Okay, They're not necessarily mentioned here. They're all just kind of lumped in together with these people that made it through everything that we just read about in Revelation. But really, whenever you read... Uh, more details about the the resurrection and people coming up from the ground and 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 going up to be with the Lord and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you realize that all of us are going to be part of that, and it kind of makes sense as you keep reading. Say verse five says this: "But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished." This is the first resurrection, meaning the resurrection that takes place, it's a little bit confusing when you read this, the resurrection that takes place before the millennial kingdom, okay, before the thousand years, that's the first resurrection, okay? And here's how we know that. Look at verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. Aren't you, aren't you glad for that? You know, the old saying goes that you, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're saved, you only die once. Right. If you, so, if you, how's it go? If you, oh man, I'm messing up. If you were born, hey, here it go. If you were, if you were born once, you die twice. If you were born twice, meaning that you were born in the spirit, or born a second time, then you only die once. Does that make sense? <laughs> you don't have to taste of the second death. Did I mess it up? You get the point. Okay. He's, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, okay, by the way, so what happens before we rule and reign with him on, on, on the earth, we stand before Jesus at this judgment seat and he grants us rewards, okay? Now, what is the rewards? I don't know 100% what all is involved there, but there seems to be inferences in the Bible that lead me to believe that part of your reward is what's going to happen, what, what you're going to do during that thousand years when you rule and reign with Christ. Man, if you work with Him on this life, you know, you're going to be living in this certain situation. You're going to be ruling over all the... You might be like, hey, I don't want that responsibility. I don't know. Maybe you'll be the janitor or something like that, but <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with being a janitor, by the way. <laughs> I've, been, I've been one for many years. But, you know, what you do on this life, you're going to be re rewarded in that millennial kingdom for a thousand years ruling and reigning with Christ and there's going to be some uh, reward granted there verse 7 and when the thousand years are expired Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is the sand of the sea and they went up on the breadth of the uh, earth encompassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them and the devil that deceived them were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Done with him. He's gone at that point. Okay. So what happens now? Well, you remember the dead in Christ, you know, have already been resurrected, but that was the first resurrection. Okay. And that was the, they didn't, the people that were in the first resurrection, they didn't have to taste of the second death. And now we're going to talk about that second resurrection. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, most people believe, and I... I I lean towards this way as well. Most scholars believe, I'm not a scholar, but <laughs> here's what I believe, that the books is probably re referring to the Word of God. Okay, so he saw these books, and this is God's Word. These are the commandments. These are all these things that God said, hey, you need to do this and don't do this and, and all that. So these books are open. But then over here is this other book, and this other book is the book of life. 
Okay? And so then it says, uh, they were, uh, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea uh, gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. We're not in there, okay? Because we've already been in the resurrection. We're already with the Lord. Okay, but this is the second resurrection. Those who never received Christ. And here's what it says, And death and hell were cast into... I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so yeah. So these people were judged uh, according to their works. And it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. We don't have to worry about the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So he's got this other book. Okay, so you want to be judged according to your works? And this is what I think about every time we knock on the door of somebody and, and they say, well, yeah, to go to heaven, you just got to be a good person. And I'm like, okay, do you really want to stand before God and say, God, judge me according to my works? Because the reality is every single person that stands before God and says, judge me according to my works is going to find themselves in hell. When they don't have to. Because right over here is this other book, the book of life. And all you got to do is say, well, yeah, I, I trusted Jesus. And so, like, my name's in the book. And they open up and say, yep, Jesus, you know, Jesus died. You received him and, and you were saved. And so, uh, so you get to go to heaven. But the problem is everybody says, no, 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 I want to be judged by God according to my works. Well, I don't. <laughs> now, I do want to be judged according to the righteous things that I did on this life. And I don't want to lose those rewards because I spent this whole life selfishly thinking about how I can please my own flesh and all those kind of things. I want to live for the Lord so that he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And he's going to reward me for what I did on this life. Last verse, and then we're done. Second Corinthians, uh, let's see, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. I hate going off script. All right, go to uh, verse 11 to help clarify what I read in uh, Revelation 20. I think this will, this will help you understand. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it hath been revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, who is he talking about here? I believe he's talking to Christians. Because it said, the foundation is Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. That's, the found, that's foundational. You have to, you're not going to heaven if you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ. So you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. That's just the foundation, though. Now... We're going to add to that foundation, not because it has anything to do with us going to heaven, but it has to do with the rewards that we get in heaven. And so he says, okay, so here's the things that you build on that foundation. In your life as a Christian, I'm um, building on that. You got wood, hay, stubble over here, and you got gold, silver, precious stone over here. If they're all tried by fire, what's going to be left? Just the gold, silver, precious stone. All the wood, hay, stubble is going to be burned up. And in our lives as Christians, every single thing we do that's just, I mean, maybe it's wicked. Or maybe it's not wicked, but it just it doesn't profit anything for the kingdom of God. Like there's some things we have to do. We have to sleep, for instance. I don't think we're going to get credit in heaven for sleeping, but we're also not going to be punished for sleeping, right? It's just nothing. It just doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. So if you sleep less and do good works instead of sleeping, God will... No, I'm just kidding. Sleep's good for you. It helps you be more productive later. <laughs> okay. All those don't matter. You have to have a job, right? And you can do good things and get rewards in heaven for your job. But if you're just going and you're doing your work and you're getting the job done and then you go home, like, hey, great. You may, you, you know, paid the bills or whatever. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting rewards in heaven for that. But I'm pretty certain that every time, unless you're doing it to be seen of men, right? Because then you don't get a reward. Every time you say, you know what? I'm going to go uh, sacrifice some time to go give the gospel to people. I'm going to go soul winning, right? I believe you're going to get rewards in heaven for that. Every time you say, you know what? I'm going to give this up for the Lord 
so that I could live more righteously, holy, and, and, and do better things for him, whatever. You can be rewarded for that. You know, every time, man, I, I mean, the list goes on. I don't want to start naming things, and, and I'm not, that's not what the message is about, okay? But the message is just about the fact that God is going to judge. And as Christians, you can say like, well, you know what? I'm going to heaven anyway. He's not going to judge me for my sin. Yeah, but he is judging you. He's going to judge you according to righteous. He's going to judge you according to your wickedness by burning that all up with fire. None of it's going with you. Okay. Only thing that's going with you to heaven are those things that you did for Christ. And so that should motivate us all as Christians to say, you know what? I don't want to just be riding on my own secret sins and, and hiding that and, and not really people think that I'm being this good Christian. They think that I love the Lord, but really inside I'm bitter and I'm not really, uh, you know, I don't have faith and, and all this kind of stuff. No, live out your Christian life. Give it to the Lord. Be in good communication with him. Live for him. Lay up treasures in heaven. And one day, no matter how long it might take, God's not going to forget. And no matter who you are, where you came from, how you were raised, he will judge you according to your works. Okay, But you want to definitely be in the category of those who have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because if you're judged according to your works at the second judgment, the great white throne judgment, you're in trouble. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and these truths and the, just the, the blessed hope that we have. As Christians, Lord, we don't have to worry uh, your wrath in heaven. Uh, certainly, you're going to punish us when we live wickedly on this earth and, and we'll deal with it on this earth but, and for our own foolishness and whatever. But, but Father, I thank you that we don't have to worry about tasting of the second death uh, thank you that you've saved us. Thank you for loving us even when we were sinners and sending Jesus to die for us and for uh, uh, just the opportunity we have to worship you and praise you in this church. Well, I pray that you'll help us, Lord, as we have such a great uh, privilege. Help us just to recognize that with that privilege comes great responsibility and help us use uh, that opportunity to go out and, and, uh, and preach your word, to assemble and to... Um, encourage and fellowship with one another and all the things we have the liberty to do lord help us not take advantage not to make take it lightly but to uh to to utilize that opportunity that we could do more for you and lay up treasures in heaven i pray you help us as a church to grow in our love and our knowledge for uh, of you and your word and help us walk in the spirit lord that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh and that we might bring glory and honor to your name in jesus name i pray amen